just about to begin now. So great to see so many people here. Great to see so many people online as well. Absolutely great to see you all. If we haven't met before, uh, my name is Isaac. I'm 21. I'm from Wicklow. I'm a third year at UCD studying zoology there. And if this is one of your first times at church, you are really, really welcome online as well. Great to see you all here. And absolutely looking forward to this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be here for about an hour. We're going to have Matthew speaking, who knows how long it could go on for. And then there'll be a chance to chat afterwards as well. Uh, especially big welcome to everyone online. As I said, you know, by no means any less part of this service. Absolutely vital, absolutely valued. Great to see you here. Stephen is our online host. So if he's chatting to you, sending you a message, uh, don't freak out. He's a good guy. Uh, say hi to him if anything's going on. Do message him. And just a couple notices then on COVID as well. Obviously, masks, uh, elbow bumps is the norm. We all know this. It's a one-way system. So coming in through that door, coming out through that door. So at the end, please do leave through that door. And then there's going to be re re refreshments there. And um, yes, as, as the surface does end, please uh, do, we, the, the ask is to promptly leave and then gather outside that we'll be able to chat there, take off the masks and all that. So if you could refrain from lingering here too long at the end, if you could come out, that would be awesome. And then there's some great snacks waiting for you there. So just a couple of thoughts as we come into the beginning of this service. Recently, I was in the book of Daniel earlier this week, Daniel chapter two, and just a couple bits of context as to what was going on here. So it's the country of Israel, obviously is the main country of the Bible. It's been invaded by Babylon and it's come in and it's taken away all its kind of upper class, its ruling class, the learned people, the elite. It's taken them away from Israel to put them into Babylon to try to, you know, get them into the Babylonian customs and uh, kind of like change Israel from the inside out. And so Daniel, from this book, Daniel's one of the guys who's been taken. So he's gone from Israel, he's now held in captivity in Babylon, and he's kind of high up there. And so the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he has a really disturbing dream. We see this at the start of this chapter. A really disturbing dream, and he, he wants to try to figure out what it's about. So he calls in all the magicians, all the enchanters, all the wise men of Babylon, and he says, look here, tell me what my dream means, because it's really freaked me out. But... I want to know that it's legit, so I'm not going to tell you what the dream was. I need you to tell me firstly what the dream was, and then secondly the interpretation. So I'm not going to give you any information. I don't want you making something up. I need to know this is real. Now, and then he also says, if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. I'm not, and not just I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill everyone. All the wise people of Babylon, I'm going to kill you all, so no pressure. Uh, and they, of course, say, look, we can't do this. We can't do this. It's too hard. And look at the statement they say in verse 11. They say, what the king has asked is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. So then Dan, Nebuchadnezzar is obviously furious. He says, I'm going to kill you all, and he starts rounding them up. Before he does this, as he does this, Daniel, he prays to God, and God gives him the answer. If you read on to the end of the chapter. It's amazing. It's this really cool interpretation. So God actually gives him the dream without him ever having dreamt the dream. He then tells Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is absolutely blown away. And then you see here, verse 47, you know, he says, the king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. And it's absolutely amazing, this huge moment. But the reason why I'm saying this is what a response that is to what those Babylonian wise men say. Where they say this is something for the gods and the gods don't live among humans wrong look at what happens here not the god of the bible the god of ccc the god here absolutely wrong it's saying that god is real the god is near the god is here today in this place online at your home he's here He's here as we worship. He's here as we pray. He's here as Matthew talks. He's here as we listen to him. God is living with us. At the end of the service, when you go home, as you go to work, he's here. He's real. Here, here, here. With you, with you, with you. All of us. And so, I don't know about you, but that makes me want to worship genuinely, as if I'm actually talking to God. 
to actually pray with expectation, knowing that God's going to hear and to listen intently because it's actually going to be God speaking. And so that's the encouragement. God is here right now. He is going to speak. And so the question is, as we go into the services, are we going to listen? Let's pray and then we'll worship. God, thank you that you are here. Thank you that you live among us, that you are with us, you are real. And God, I just pray as we go into this service now, would you help us open up, engage, and hear what you have to say. We worship you. Let's all stand. And so I think if I believe with the new restrictions where we're allowed to stand and sing, so that's just amazing. Love what Isaac was saying then. Let's take this moment and just worship our God who's present. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, the faithful promises.
seat. So wonderful to sing the praises of God together. Uh, we've missed it. Uh, big thank you to Leanne and Craig and Andrew who have been leading us faithfully without singing. It's not an easy job for them, so well done. Uh, I'm going to lead us in some prayer, and uh, I want to introduce you to a key prayer aid. Anyone know what that is? A teaspoon. You're thinking Steve has gone mad. No. Uh, how do you summarize teaspoon in a recipe book? TSP. Okay. I'm teaching you all how to pray. Thanks, T. Sorry, S. P, please. We're going to do that now. So, teaspoon. I'm going to use a bit of Psalm 23, and then there's going to be a few moments where I'm going to leave a pause for you guys to. Uh, just where you are, pray for the things that come into your mind. So I'll pray, I'll leave a pause, you pray silently, and then I'll carry on. So let's prepare to pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are a shepherd to us. We've just sung, Father, that great is your faithfulness through all of history and through all of our lives. You're that shepherd. You guide us, you lead us, you protect us. We thank you, Lord, that you're the one that says, with you there need be no want. That in you all our desires are met, that we're satisfied. And we know also that with you, not only is there no want, there need be no fear. Because you are with us. And your rod and your staff, they protect us. So we say thank you and praise you for being such a good and a great shepherd. We ask, Lord, at this time that you would guide us individually and corporately to be our shepherd, to lead us through these strange days. But most of all, that what you're leading us through and to is to yourself, to green pastures and enjoyment with you. Thank you for your generosity, Lord, every day, new mercies. You're not just a shepherd, you're the one that is a host. And we dwell in your house and we thank you for your generosity and your love and your grace that's poured out on our lives every day. Just where you are, take a moment to think of the last week and how God has been generous as a shepherd to you and thank him for that. We also, Lord, want to come and say sorry. The flip side of you being a shepherd, Lord, is that we are sheep. And like sheep, we often just follow where we get the quickest satisfaction. And we wander from the paths of righteousness into the path of sin. And Lord, you tell us not to fear because you're with us. But this week, Lord, we have feared. You have been too small in our minds and other things have been too big and we have given way to fear. And we say, sorry, Lord, that we haven't enjoyed the presence of your house. We've sought enjoyment in things that aren't necessarily bad, but we've put them above you and enjoying you. We've taken you for granted this week, Lord. We've taken others for granted this week. And we say sorry. So just take a moment where you are to think how you want to say sorry to the Good Shepherd. Lord, we can't read Psalm 23 without thinking of you coming years later to say, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So we thank you that when we say sorry, we can be assured of forgiveness because you have uh, died for us and cleansed us of our sin 
And we thank you for that. And so, Lord, we come and say, please, today we think about Psalm 88 and the darkness in our world and the darkness in our souls and the darkness in our situations. And so, Lord, I just think of two things as we come to say, please, to you. Please, would you act? Please, would you uh, move? Please, would you bring light in the darkness? We think of our own places of suffering or those in our family and friends or this community of believers where there is suffering and loneliness and depression and isolation and hurt and loss. Lord, it says here, you restore our souls. Please, Lord, restore those that are depleted. And Lord, we, we think of the darkness in Afghanistan. And we come to you, the God of heaven, the one that was just read about in the book of Daniel, the great revealer of mysteries, the one who was enabling your servants to answer the evil Nebuchadnezzar. And we think of our day and the, the, the evil people that are wanting to uh, bring oppression uh, to that land. We think of the people, particularly the women, who are fearing now because of what the future holds for them. Lord, may they know you. May there be an outbreak of you in that country and people discovering the Good Shepherd. We pray for the, the politicians, if, if we can call them that, but we pray for the rulers, those that are, are, are forcing their way into that country. We ask, Lord, that they would have something of a conviction of, of you and your greatness, as Nebuchadnezzar did. He thought he could rule the world. He thought he could do what he wanted, and then he encountered a humble but powerful servant, Daniel, who could reveal mysteries. And we pray for that kind of breakthrough in the lives of the leaders of the Taliban. And we pray for church pastors and leaders and Christians in that land. I was reading this week, Father, of a group of pastors who were praying as the Taliban overtook. And they went to the book of Daniel. And they were greatly encouraged that even Nebuchadnezzar was somehow within your plans. So we pray, strengthen them. Give them your courage and your wisdom. And may they not shrink back from the suffering that may be coming from them. Help them to persevere that they might be able to face death as Daniel's three friends and as Daniel did because they know they're honoring you. And may we, living in comfortable Dublin, be stirred on by such thoughts. And so we pray another prayer from Daniel. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and disposes of them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. We pray that you would do that at this time in that land. Just take a moment where you are to pray either for situations and people who are suffering or the nation of Afghanistan. So we thank you, Lord, that you are the great God of all history and all of our lives, and we can entrust all these things and ourselves into your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. And yeah, what a joy it is that we are able to pray. God does hear. It's not just us thinking. It's not just meditating. It is real. What a joy that is. So... You're just coming on now online. Welcome. We're just about time now for our organized mandatory fund of the week. So, icebreaker question is today What is your ideal holiday spot? What is your ideal holiday spot? Chat to the person beside you, and we'll get back in a second. Awesome. Very good. What were we saying? I'm looking in the chat here on, on the online. Stephen says, any spot for me will do right now. I think that's probably a sentiment we all agree with. Seeing a bit of Portugal. Luckily for me, I, I've, I've just been in the west of Ireland. I came back yesterday. Uh, some serious spot. Not a lot of sun, so maybe Portugal might have been better for that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, who, who doesn't want a holiday, you know? Right on. Today, now, we're just on our time for kids. So we've got Den 
in the second floor. So if you follow Becca and Hannah and everyone else. Uh, so that is for primary school kids. Uh, and then we've also got the crest, which is downstairs. So that is also definitely available as well. So we'll just pray for the kids as they go through. So God, thank you for the kids here at CCC. Uh, thank you, God, for the, the leaders who are going to be taking them now. And I just pray that you would speak and that they would have a great crack as well. Amen. Brilliant. I'm just going to call Mimi. Oh, Mimi's here. Mimi's Very good. here already. She just appears. Mimi, what were you saying for uh, the icebreaker? Where would you go? Uh, I said I didn't want to answer this. Um, I'd go, I think the best holiday I've had was Verona because it was the culture, the food, the people. It was a good time. So, yeah. Brilliant times. Very good. Right. So, news. Connect, this is today. This is after the service. Connect is happening for basically, if you're new to CCC, if you um, are starting to think about it, uh, we definitely, definitely recommend you please come today. It is after the service, 6.15 to 7.15. It's going to be in here. So go out, go have your, your snacks and everything, then come back in. And it's just a chance to find out more about what CCC is, what CCC isn't. Uh, and how you can get involved. I did it as I started to come here, and it was absolutely class. So do definitely think about coming to that. Okay, so the church is hosting a summer of theological theology school. That word always gets in my head. Sorry. Um, so this is going to be running from tomorrow all the way through to Friday in the mornings, from quarter past nine to half past twelve at the Irish Bible Institute. So this is for people who come to church and, you know, they are hungry to kind of know more about um, theology and deeper topics that you can't always discuss in a Sunday sermon. Um, so it's, you might like to come, you can sign up for the whole week, you can sign up for a couple of days, whatever you're flexible with. There's going to be five different speakers. Steve is one of them, so do turn up and support him. And um, it's not only for this church, it's for all the communities in Dublin. So if you have other friends and other churches or people who you know ask you theological questions, invite them to come along. It's free. Um, and then you can grab a coffee with them afterwards and catch up. Speaking of coffee, the next bit is often in the park which is happening next week saturday this is one of my favorites even though i'm not going to be here so it's going to be at three o'clock in phoenix park and you all are invited to attend it's going to be a good time to kind of meet together after what's happened you know in the past couple of months that we want to talk about um and it's going to be a chance for us to celebrate summer get together you know say hi to people you haven't seen in a while so do we do invite everyone to turn up there's going to be games um so bring some snacks drinks and whatever you like and hopefully we'll see you there. Awesome. Finally, the survey as well. We finally got to the 70, so we can stop badging you in about it. But there's still two days left until we're going to close it. So if you haven't done it, please do do it. It's just a great way as a church to see where we're at and figure out the next steps as well for the next 18 months. So it's on some emails. If you're not on the emails, it's on the website. Uh, and if you don't have anything, come chat to Steve and then he'll sort you out. So please do do that. You've got two days um, and it'll be great to hear your insights. Very good. Thank you, Mimi. We're just going to head now uh, into the reading. So Kieran's going to come up and then we'll get going. Brilliant. I'm Sam, 88. Um, a song, Sam of the Sons of Korah for the director of music, according to Mahalaf Lianov a mascal of Heman the Ezraite. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You've put me in the lowest pit in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You've overwhelmed me with all your waves. You've taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I'm confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? 
but I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. And I'll, I'll just pray for Matthew before he comes up. Um, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll use Matthew to speak to us and that he'll <laughs> make sense of all this darkness. And then just pray that you'd be with him and you'd uh, watch over him and us and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Kieran. Guys, I'm sure as that psalm was read, you're kind of sitting wondering where on earth is it going to uh, veer upwards? It seems that it started here and it just descended downhill. And I, I'm convinced that this is an absolutely unique psalm. And so we're really, we're, we're going to jump into it. We're going to get a, an, an idea of the feel of it. And, and I'm hoping that it's going to become a tool in our arsenal. It's going to become a psalm that we could put into your back pocket and use on rainy days. So church, my, my name is Maffey. If I haven't met you before, then uh, I, I serve here in the staff team at Christ City Church. Really good to see you. I'd love to get caught up with you outside afterwards. And if you've been coming along or you want to find out more about the church, then we're going to be doing Connect in here again afterwards. So we're currently in our fourth week out of five on our series of Psalms of Lament. And you can pick up our other talks on the website or on Spotify. Uh, they're all available there. And so I, I think we're going to dive into what is possibly the darkest corner, or one of the darkest corners of the Bible, um, as we dive into Psalm 88. And so you might have noticed in, in Kieran's reading the lack of hopefulness, the, the somber tone, the lack of any kind of praise in the psalm. I might even feel out of place hearing these words, or hearing these words read, or hearing somebody actually talk to God in this way. But as, as you can see, and as you know, the Psalms are full of intense, raw language, really raw language, but it almost always ends on a hopeful note. It almost always goes upwards towards the end. But Psalm 88 begins with, I cry out day and night before you, verse 1, and then it ends in pain, and it says, my companions have become darkness, or darkness is my closest friend verse 18. And so perhaps this is your reality today, however big or however small. Um, but do you know what? It's not long before our minds could maybe be taken to the disaster in Haiti. Or as we begin to think about, about lamenting, maybe it wouldn't be long before our minds are taken to Afghanistan. I cry out day and night before you. My companions have become darkness. My uh, Darkness is my closest friend. And so over the last two weeks, we all saw the horrors in the news of women, children, followers of Jesus, the, the persecution each of those are beginning to face as the Taliban begin to implement their strict interpretation of Sharia law. And so as people begin to flee to the airport in one way and then begin to flee into the mountains and the villages in the other way, perhaps this psalm is a fitting psalm very appropriate to their experience. And so for us, the question that begs is what do we do when darkness seems to have the final word? And so for so many in Afghanistan now, darkness appears to have the final word. You know, these Psalms will serve as springboards to help us process our thoughts, help us process our emotions while in the midst of darkness. And so perhaps for you, it's coming through the other side of the pandemic and emerging into a changed world. And, and maybe for others, it's grappling with the loss of loved ones. Perhaps delayed uh, grief, might be frustration with the government responses, perhaps, whatever it may be, these psalms of lament can help direct our cries of frustration, can help direct our cries of anguish and desperation toward God rather than away from him. And so whenever darkness seems to have the final word, Psalm 88 can be so helpfully adopted and so this, this is the direction we're going to go today. When it seems that there is life without death, life without light, present your lament. Whenever it seems that there's death without hope, prostrate your heart. And, and we'll explain a little bit as we get there. And then when it seems that there's questions without answers, I'm going to suggest that we persist in prayer. So life without light. 
Look at verses 1 and 2, if you've got a Bible open. It says, look, look with me at how the psalmist begins. Lord, you are the God who saves me. And day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. The psalmist has hit rock bottom. He's literally in the pit. He's overwhelmed with troubles. He feels like he's near death. The psalmist despairs of life itself. He can see nothing good. There's nothing positive. There's nothing encouraging. And yet it seems that God is not responding. God seems to be doing absolutely nothing about it. And the psalmist is so brutally honest. Look, look on the screen. Verse 6, you have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and you've made them repulsive to me. The psalmist is absolutely going at God. And guys, sometimes it seems that the weight of our trials are so severe that we can't keep our head above the water. The pain is so raw. The, the disappointment is so heavy. And we simply can't imagine the, the situation ever changing. We can't see healing. We can't articulate any kind of hope. But then whenever we try to articulate a hope, it just hurts all the more. And so we'd rather not pray and we're tempted just to turn the other way. But church, I want to say it's in these moments of sorrow when it seems that there is life without light, the very thing we need to do is actually to present your lament. Whenever it seems that there is life without light, the very thing we need to do is present your lament. Do you see it? The psalmist is having it out with God. The psalmist is having it out with God. He's given God all he's got. He's telling him how he feels. He's showing him where he's at. And even he's laying the blame on God. And so for, for some of you, that might, might actually sound offensive. It might appear theologically incorrect. And you, you might find yourselves itching at this point. But do you, yet look at verse 9. Look, look at what's happening. In verse 9 he says, I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. I've known, I've known times in my life whenever, whenever Christians, and including myself, hesitate from saying things to God. Because one, it doesn't sound right. Well, two, it doesn't sound holy. Three, it doesn't sound proper. And it doesn't fit with my picture of Almighty God, so I won't say it. But yet, look at what the psalmist does here. He lays his emotions out before God. There's no mention of sin here there, at all. There's no mention of retribution. There's no mention of having done anything wrong to deserve this. The psalmist is simply presenting his lament while he is in the darkness. Church, you are given permission to present your lament before God. These psalms help model ways for us in which we can express every aspect of our heart before our Father. And so Psalm 88 kind of gives us a space and this freedom uh, to do that very thing. So that in seasons of darkness, whenever we find ourselves in a pit, we've now got words to use. We've got Psalm 88 to do the very thing that this guy Haman the Ezraite actually did. And what's that is to call out to the Lord every day to spread out your hands before him. Have it out with God. Share exactly what's on your mind, the emotions that you're feeling. Involve God in the process. And so in Psalm 88, we're really just in the Bible descending as low as we can go emotionally. But yet our hope in a listening, personal, relational Lord still remains. And so we never give up in prayer. We know God is still there. And he might have good reason for playing hard to reach in, in specific cases. But God does know us an explanation. Yet for our part, let's not hold back with, with our emotive expressions of distress. Let's not hold back with our disappointment and how things are working. When, when was the last time you told God you were disappointed? When was the last time you maybe told God you were disappointed in him? So when it seems that there's life without light, let's present our lament. And as we move on, we can see in verses 10 to 12 that there's death without hope. So when it seems that there's death without hope, I want to suggest we prostrate our heart. And the psalmist takes a, a series of six rhetorical questions. So and on the screen, you can see there's six questions, each before God, and they all anticipate a negative response. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Of course not. The dead are dead. Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? No, of course not. How can they be? The psalmist feels as close to death as one can actually be, and, and he's crying out before God against a sense of injustice. And, and all the questions are the same point. His cry of desperation is as if to say, God, you're the God of the living, and if you're the God of the living, 
and you want to be taken seriously, then you need to keep me alive. How can I worship you whenever I'm dead? It's impossible. Remember back to verse 1, the, the psalmist begins and he says, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. I want to suggest that this raw, this emotive language and these rhetorical questions that you can see in the screen are actually indicators of a deeper faith and not a lesser one. Could you imagine yourself saying them same words to God? I think so often we, we refrain from these things because it seems, oh, well, it shows that I have a lack of faith. I want to suggest that this raw and emotive language is actually a deeper and more intimate faith where there's nothing hidden, everything is on the table, there's absolutely no holding back. And isn't there something beautiful about the psalmist's authenticity? As he, as he appeals before God, he's able to do this. How and why? Because he knows well, he knows well the one he unleashes his appeal towards. He can do this because he knows God well. But yet there's a strangeness, isn't there, with this kind of response that we all struggle with. In, in his blog, Steve wrote, one of the challenges facing the Western church is that we can so often imbibe the worldview of our culture and the grand narrative of progress, advance, and success. But the problem is this worldview doesn't fit with many of our lives. And it certainly doesn't fit with much of the church across the globe. We're not all happy, prosperous, and beautiful people that we're told we can become. And if we're not careful, our language and our worship can easily communicate only praise and never lament. Only progress and never faltering. Only advance and never stagnation. Only success and never failure. And so then this has a devastating effect on those both inside and outside the church. One of my own struggles, and I, I read this and I'm like, oh, Maff, if only you'd read this two to three years ago, then you wouldn't have done what you'd done. But one of my own struggles with learning how to lament came a couple of years ago. I lost both my grandfathers in the space of three months. And it, it was tough, but ultimately life had to go on. And so whenever... Uh, whenever some people came around me at CCC, they gave me the space to lament. They gave me the space to grieve. They gave me the space to share my thoughts, share my feelings. But what I'd done was I so naturally jumped to the good things and to the promises of God, the reassurances. And, and I, I jumped to these things that are true about God, they're true about life, and they're true about his word, they're theologically correct, and they're good, and they made me feel good. I did that to try and soften the blow. I jumped to the promises, but I actually skipped the process. And this is key. As, I, as a result, I wasn't actually lamenting before God, but I was trying to cover my pain from him. And so it was only whenever I received some gentle prodding, some questions, and was given, a, given an open space with a couple of lads around the table, that I really understand that what I was actually doing was I, I was holding back my deepest emotions. I was holding back my deepest thoughts from God. But I was also robbing him of the worship that he was due through my lament. So I robbed God of, of worship because I wasn't lamenting. And I was robbing myself of the chance to properly grieve my losses. It wasn't progress. It wasn't success. It wasn't advance. I was in a season where I felt like I was simply holding on, thriving, felt like a million miles away. The idea of thriving was totally foreign. So when it seems that there's death without hope, I want to suggest you prostrate your heart, you lay it all out before the Lord. And so as the psalmist draws the, 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 the psalm to a close, and as he draws this lament to a close, it seems that there's questions without answers. 14, rejected, suffering, despair, destroyed. He says, I, I cry out for help to you, Lord, and the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me, God? So he, he's, he's rejected, he's suffering, he's in despair. He says, God's wrath has swept over him. And he uses words like destroyed, surrounded, engulfed. The psalmist has been afflicted and there doesn't seem to be any letting up. There doesn't seem to be any answers coming. And then the psalm closes off with, you have taken my companions and loved ones from me. Darkness is my closest friend. Church, when it seems that there's only questions coming, but no answers, persistent prayer. 
The truth of Psalm 88 is that we live in a world where sometimes there's no answer. That's a tough pill to swallow. Sometimes there's no answer. A world where God isn't always on call. But it doesn't mean that we stop calling. So like the psalmist, we persist in prayer. Psalm 88 isn't a psalm of, of, of mute depression, but it's rather one where the psalmist is forcing a conversation. The psalmist is actually asking the hard questions. So he's forcing the conversation, he's vocalizing his thoughts and his feelings, he's given God permission and space to come in and bring hope and restoration. He's saying, God, I need you to come in and do this. And so these questions actually force the conversation forward. Whereas for me in my grief, I was avoiding them. I was trying to jump through the process and go straight to the promises. And in, in the end up, I was actually, uh, actually not, not, not worshiping correctly and robbing myself of true grief. Robbing myself of true lament. And so in asking these questions, it forces a conversation and in doing so, it actually matures our faith. It matures our faith. It, 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 do, it doesn't send it off the rails. You know, if we didn't trust that God cared and if we didn't trust that God is listening, then we would remain silent. But the psalmist continues to speak. He continues to speak. Why? Because he knows and he trusts that God cares. Otherwise, he wouldn't speak. So we've got Psalm 88 as, as proof of, of one in distress who didn't remain silent. So whenever darkness seemed to have the final word, he presented his lament. When darkness seemed to have the final word, he prostrated his heart. And whenever darkness seemed to have the final word, he persisted in prayer. So as we've been exploring what it looks like to lament with raw, authentic language in the last four weeks, there's something really important that we've got to understand when it comes to lament. And that simply is the difference between a lament and a complaint. A difference in a lament and a complaint. Paul Miller puts it really simply in his book, A Praying Life. Wonderful book. If you haven't got it, please get it. If you can't afford it, email Steve. He'll get it for you. <laughs> and if you're listening on Spotify in years or months to come, this, uh, this offer expires in one week. But the, there's a great difference in a lament and a complaint. And Paul Mauer says, a lament is faith. A complaint is rebellion. Laments are directed toward God, but complaints grumble about God to anybody but him. It's similar to the difference between confrontation and gossip. When you're frustrated with somebody and you refuse to talk to them directly, aren't you tempted to let your, leak, your, your thoughts leak out in, in, in gossip? You're sitting around the table and you're chatting about that person. It seems so much easier to chat to somebody else about that person than to go to God or go to that person and, and actually, actually have that confrontation, actually get it out in the open, actually resolve it. Instead of gossiping about God indirectly, a lamenter courageously addresses him to his face. There's such a difference. A lament is faith, a complaint is rebellion. But laments also submit to God. So even whenever there's questions asked of them, they'll come under God's judgment. So they'll ask the questions, but they'll come and they'll submit themselves under the Lord. And so in, in laments, we actually find our rightful place before God. But yet, interestingly, complaints actually make demands of God. So whenever we begin to complain, we actually elevate our place above the Lord. And as we do that, we make demands of him where he needs to answer or else. And so what we do is, we, we bring ourselves to a position above him rather than submitting to him. One of the crucial things with laments is they, they always will circle around. Apart from Psalm 88, they'll circle around to faith. You'll see all the other Psalms and all the other laments in the Bible will circle around to faith. And the question is, how does God respond to our laments? So what do we do? We, we, we lament we, we give it out. We, we bring it all to the Lord. And what does he do? How does God respond to our laments? He responds by pointing us forward. He points us forward. Our, our crucified and our resurrected king, Jesus, personally experienced the same kinds of loss, same kinds of confusion, darkness, and infinitely worse. But yet whenever we approach God with our laments, we don't approach a vague being Rather, we, we, we approach one who knows well what it is to suffer, who knows well what disappointment looks like, who knows well what frustration and abandonment feels like. 
But yet for us, this, this doesn't mean that we skip to the end of the story. We, we, we don't pole vault over the pain, so to speak. We actually must go through it and we must grow through it. There's no shortcuts. But I want to tell you that God doesn't waste any of our pain. And you know, as God, as, as God meets us in, in Christ, and as God points us forward toward Christ, that doesn't mean there's going to be an answer to that question or to that pain. You know, there will, be answer, there will be questions that you won't get the answer for. There will be pain and there will be suffering that you'll go through that you may not receive an answer for this side of eternity. And I want to tell you, it's okay. Because the very same as here in Psalm 88. The very same as in Psalm 88. But God responds to our laments by pointing us forward toward Christ, but also by uniting us with Christ. So Christ said to church, since God unites us to Jesus as we lament, so then we can create space for others to lament. So that God would do the very same for them. So the environment that we create will actually shape the laments that our brothers and sisters will go through. Laments have the actual potential to nourish an even greater intimacy. Did you know that lamenting before the Lord could really, really kickstart your relationship with him? It's got the potential to nourish greater intimacy with Jesus. But yet it mustn't become a process to be rushed. And as a church, we've, we've got to get good at creating a space for others to have it out before the Lord. Whenever it's so tempting to jump on them and say, well, that's, that's theologically correct, that's wrong, you shouldn't be feeling that way. But if we create a space where our brothers and sisters can freely and can openly lament in a safe space, then it actually can nourish intimacy, can nourish relationship. So whether church it's in your city group or whether it's in your life group, maybe it's in your friendship groups, I'd encourage you to encourage lamenting as a form and as an act of worship, creating space to, for others to have that freedom to lament without the fear of judgment, without the fear of correction. And can, Andrew, can I just invite you back up? So whether church you, you, you find yourself lamenting before God or whether you find yourself in the coming months to create space maybe in your home, for others to lament, for others to grieve. Know this, that whenever darkness seems to have the final word, God has created for you and me a prayer in Psalm 88 by this guy called Haman the Ezraite. I have no idea what he was going through, but I know that he has voiced words to God that God has given to me and to you that we can use to lament as an act of worship before the Lord. We've been given words that, and prayers that actually unites us to Jesus. So church, if you're able, can I, can I invite you to stand? And, and for guys online, I'd, I'd encourage you to engage in, in the song. Jesus, I thank you that you know well what, what it is to, um, to have unanswered questions. You know what, well what it is to have disappointment and to have abandonment and to have frustrations. And you cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus, may we be a church that follows suit in the sense that we, that we can cry out before our Father in, in every season, that we wouldn't rob ourselves of lament, that we wouldn't rob ourselves of grief, that we wouldn't rob ourselves of the chance to engage with the living God, with our true thoughts, with our true feelings. Jesus, may we become a church that matures to the point where we can create the space for others to lament freely and where we can journey with one another as we, as we so often go through the process. And Jesus, may your promises be a bright light. May they be a shining light, but may we not neglect lamenting. May we not neglect the process. Jesus, I thank you that as the Father has pointed us forward, he has pointed us toward you and he unites us to you today. Lord Jesus, in your name.
our God. And let us not forget what that statement means. That you are in control. You are here. You are listening. You do care. And just like the psalmist, God, would you help us to persist in our prayers. To remember that you are listening. And when, when the temptations come to give up, God, please, would you help us stay strong? Please, would you help us remember you are the God so. Would you help us pre- present our laments, to prostrate our hearts, to persist in prayer? God, thank you that you point us forward to you. Thank you that you unite us with you. Thank you, God, that as we leave today, we are not alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, that is the official end of the service. If you just want to take your seats quickly. Thank you so much for coming. It's it's been great to see you. Just a couple reminders. If you're online, there's breakout rooms going to be happening on in a sec. So do stick around if you want. We have the church survey. So you have two more days to go through that. If you'd like to, please, would you be really helpful? We have the summer school of theology. Do sign up for that. It's going to be really, really cool. And then, of course, afternoon in the park as well. To look forward to finally then again we've got connect happening this evening after the service so 6 15 come back around there'll be announcements uh, it'll be great to see you um, and yeah so that is officially it there's going to be another song happening it uh, if you'd like to sit and reflect do if you'd like to chat then please do leave through those doors and there's refreshments and snacks outside for you it's been great seeing you thank you so much